following program is for informational and educational purposes only. It is not to be considered legal advice. Fraudsters Radio was created to expose the many scams and frauds that have so infected society today. Scammers, fraudsters, and ripoff artists abound, whether it's scamming homeowners with bogus foreclosure relief services, dating fraud, incompetent lawyers, or consumer ripoffs. It's high time the public has a voice. If you work in a profession that deals with fraud, or if you believe you were or are a victim of fraud, you now have a radio listening public that wants to hear from you. Please feel free to message us through our Fraudsters Radio Facebook page, and we may have you on the show as a guest. If you'd like to call in for today's show, the number is 646-668-8512. And welcome to Fraudsters Radio. I'm Lori Z, nationally syndicated radio host and consumer advocate. And I'm here with my co-host, Storm Bradford, owner of Mortgage Fraud Examiner. Storm, is your day going well today? I'm doing good. How about you, Lori? Yep, I'm doing, I'm doing well also. Uh, on the quarter hour, I want to let our listeners know that we're going to have a pretty interesting story. It's actually from one of my doctors. And he's going to share a terrible story of what happened to him and what's going on. So we'll get to that about the quarter hour. Um, if there's anyone listening that has a question and would like to call in, they can call in at 646-668-8512. Now, since we do the show, fraudsters, it's all about people who do scams and frauds. And So, you know, Storm, how does somebody know if fraud has been committed against them? I mean, I know some cases might be very obvious, but what is it that determines fraud has been committed against the person and that it could actually be pursued legally? Well, usually fraud deals with deception, some sort of deception. I mean, it could be um, crimes such as embezzlement, which, which is a type of fraud where, uh, you know, an employee embezzles money from the employer or from the business. Uh, you know, there's the issuance of bad checks. Uh, there's theft by deception. Uh, there's... Uh, uh, you know, forgery, obviously. There's all kinds of, uh, of different ways that somebody can be defrauded, it, but it's usually the, uh, the fraud is based on some sort of deception by the perpetrator uh, against the victim. So um, as far as it is going after it, you know, if you've been defrauded, uh, I'd go after somebody. And the nice thing about fraud is, in a civil matter, if you sue somebody for fraud, you're usually looking at, because it's a tort, you're usually looking at uh, punitive damages, and that's damages to punish the wrongdoer. So outside of any compensatory damages or anything like that, you get these special damages, if you will, known as punitive damages to punish that wrongdoer for their behavior, which in some instances, um, can be a lot of money. Like, uh, as you know, we've discussed before uh, how <clears throat> Ms. Brown um, sued Quicken Loans for purposely overappraising her loan, and uh, Quicken Loans is ordered to pay her $3.6 million. And uh, I can't remember exactly how much the punies were, but uh, they were $2 million and change. I remember that. Okay, now what happens, though, in a case like that where if, if it's a huge amount, I know sometimes, you know, the company that, that committed the fraud, uh, you know, they'll, they'll come back and challenge it or appeal it if they can, um, but don't they oftentimes make the, the, the client sign, you know, some type of um, non-disclosure agreement so that it's not admitted and it can't set a case precedent? I mean, is it complicated like that? Well, I mean, just like in any type of civil case, there can be, uh, you know, where there can be a settlement and where the, uh, you know, the settlement is not made public. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, if you've been defrauded and you end up getting a ton of money, I, I wouldn't really care if it was public or not. Personally. Well, I don't know. I'm, yeah, I feel differently about that because 
I would feel like if the company did something that bad and it was worth a lot of money to force me to sign a non-disclosure uh, in order to get that money means that that bank or, or whoever it is is getting away with it and not setting a case precedent, you know, which of course helps them. So in a way, it, it's, to me, it's sort of a blackmail to do that. Well, if, um, but at the end of the day, if you look at it personally, if a company defrauded you and there was a settlement of a couple million dollars and they said, look, we're, we'll settle with you or we'll go to trial. If we settle with you, uh, this is going to be a private settlement. If not, we're going to trial. What are you going to do? All right. Well, I think a big issue for anyone who gets accused of fraud is how do they come up with the money to defend that type of a case? Our guest is going to talk a little bit about, you know, he's a doctor, so he's in a good financial position. But what happens when um, someone is not in a good financial position? Maybe they can't qualify for legal aid. But they can't afford to hire an attorney. They're in that sort of that donut hole where they can't. They what are they going to do? Because they can't do anything. They don't have any options. Well, that's that's the problem with litigation. Litigation is expensive, and that's why a lot of these cases settle. Um, you know, so at the end of the day, if, you know, if 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 you've got a case, I mean, if, if, if me personally, again, if I had no money. And the person uh, or, or group or company or whatever that defrauded me is willing to pay me, you know, for harming me, um, you know, uh, I'm in. All right. But for you, it's different because you kind of would know what you're doing. But someone, someone who's not, you know, in, in, in the legal industry, so to speak, they can't qualify for legal aid. They can't afford to hire an attorney. Is it still worth it for them to file, you know, to, to, to file a case, or is it better for them maybe to send a letter, to, you know, to the company stating, you know, I'm going to sue you, uh, and, you know, if you don't want to be sued, then we can settle out right now before it actually gets to court? Well, depending upon the type of fraud and the amount of evidence that's there, some attorneys will take it on a contingency. So... It would be my recommendation that if somebody came to me, you know, if my brother came to me and said, hey, Storm, you know, this guy defrauded me, what should I do? You know, should I, uh, you know, sue this guy? Uh, you know, if the evidence is good and he could, uh, in a lot of cases, be able to find an attorney that would take it on a contingency. Mm -hmm. And that's basically what happened to that case, that uh, Quick and Runs versus Brown case. He took that on a contingency. Then he had to have felt that he had a really good case. So I guess the attorney looking at it in a contingency, you know, would have to say, hey, I have a really good case. And also, I'm going to assume that it's usually a larger firm that is more financially secure than just an individual attorney working on his own to take that kind of case. Yeah, and, and, and see, fraud it has to be pled with, which is known as specificity, that it must the who, what, where, when, and how. You know, okay. who you know, the whole gambit has to be done. That's why a lot of people lose fraud cases because they can't um, plead it with specificity. And, but, again, if you can go to an attorney and you've got the evidence there and it can be pled with specificity, there's a very good chance they may take it on a uh, contingency. But, I mean, at least you, I would recommend anybody to go talk to an attorney. All right, what do you do in a case that maybe it's a, considered a civil crime um, and that there's, there's fraud involved and, you, you know, all of the, the people involved in the case that would technically have been uh, plaintiffs uh, get a letter from the defendant stating, hey, I'm going to pay you back or return your items, and then the next thing you know, you get a letter from the trustee that they're filing for bankruptcy. So, to all of those defendants who probably can't afford to hire attorneys anyway, um, what can they do? Do they call the trustee? Do they send the letter to the judge? If they don't have the money, how do they, how do they fight that if it's going to bankruptcy? Well, you can't bankrupt fraud, number one. So if okay. there was fraud that was committed, you can't bankrupt it. So uh, that is favorable to someone who's been injured. But, uh, you know, again, uh, 
you know, my recommendation for anyone is any time that they have a legal problem, there's a lot of lawyers that will, that will give you an opportunity to come in, speak with them for free, and tell them about your case, and then they can decide whether or not they want to take the case or not, or they may recommend you to somebody that they, but, I, but first thing out of the box is somebody should be contacting an attorney if they felt they've been defrauded. Right, but I'm speaking of a particular situation where, you know, they may not have the money to be able to do that. Well, again, they take it on a contingency. You don't know it unless you ask. Right, right. That's why I said it doesn't. It doesn't hurt to go talk to somebody and get you know get a couple of different opinions. Go talk to two or three lawyers. You know, not just one. Go talk to two or three. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I was thinking of, I guess, in a specific case where it's, it's a bunch of people and involved. A, it actually involved a consignment store. I told you a little bit about it off the air. Um, but most of these people can't afford to do that. And so when you get a bankruptcy, you know, a letter from the trustee saying you're filing bankruptcy, you can no longer contact the person that filed the bankruptcy or you can get in trouble. So I don't know what advice there would be in a situation like that. Well, you could, you could go into the bankruptcy court. A lot of these bankruptcy courts have pro se clerks that you can go in and talk to that clerk and tell them that, you know, here's somebody that took money from me uh, or did something, and they're now filing bankruptcy, how do I go about filing a proof of claim or something like that? They can help. Usually, they, they, there's somebody there that can help you with that. Gotcha. Uh, and any other mentions you have of fraud? As far as you were talking punitive damages, what makes a court decide to give punitive damages? You said you can get it, but what makes a court decide and, and how much? Well, uh, I mean, my recommendation always is, is to have a jury trial and, um, and to uh, let the jury decide how much I get. That's, uh, that would always be my recommendation for somebody instead of a bench trial is to you know, have a jury trial, go in and let the jury decide. Because most of the time, people sit on the juries, look at uh, somebody that's been defrauded, and say, for the grace of God, there goes I. And uh, right. these uh, defendant, uh, defendants who have committed fraud if they're a company or something like that, that's when they want to settle. They don't want to go in front of a jury. I gotcha. Interesting stuff. All right, well, let's do this. Uh, we, we got another couple minutes. I want to give it our, our phone number again in case anyone listening wants to call in and ask a question. It's 646-668. 8512. Let's take a break. And Jason, if you can hear me, you can go ahead and call our guests for the 115. So stay with us. Have you received a notice of foreclosure on your property? Do you suspect that you're involved in an unfair or fraudulent loan agreement? Are you looking for a way to save your home? Would you like to cut through all the misinformation and find out what really works? Would you like to learn strategies that the so-called gurus are aware of? If you answered yes to any of those questions, a professional team at Mortgage Fraud Examiners can assist you in your attorney with all of these things and more. Contract breaches, errors, statutory, regulatory violations, fraudulent appraisals, and other fraudulent conduct cause most mortgages to be legally problematic. In fact, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation found that nearly 2,000 financial institutions they assess receive citations for significant compliance violations. They also examined the appraisals and found out that of the 259 appraisals reviewed for accuracy, only seven fully complied with professional standards. Call us at 844-920-7200. That's 844-920-7200. Mortgage Fraud Examiners, 844-920-7200. Okay, we're back on with AMFM 24-7 Radio. The call-in number is 646-668-8512, and it's my understanding we have our special guest uh, on with us now. Are you there? Yes, I am. This is Dr. John Cottom. I'm a dermatologist in the Tampa Bay area, 
And I actually have a few offices, and one of them happens to be up in the Villages, which is near Wildwood, uh, south of Ocala, near Leesburg, Florida. Just the guy I need to talk to. I need to know how to get rid of these wrinkles. That's <laughs> <laughs> me. Okay. 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 He knows all the answers. He's 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 the skin expert. But that that Dr. Don, you know, you you told me an amazingly horrible story, horrible story of something that happened to you in Florida, um, uh, not so long ago. And I I wanted to cover it in the show because I know it's storms kind of thing. But would you kind would you start from the beginning and? Talk about what happened to you and how it happened. Sure. I, um, I have an office up in the villages, and when I first opened up that office, um, you have to get uh, to the villages from the main highway, the I-75, by going through a couple of zigzag roads. Well, on my second or third time up there, I forgot and missed one of my turns, and I knew I was heading in the right direction, so I just said, oh, I'll keep going. So it took me to this open, paved railroad crossing, which I could see... Uh, was taking me in the right direction, and the 301 was the other side. I could see cars passing through the, past the railroad. So I had this paved railroad crossing with no gate that I just simply took and, and went to work, no problem. Then several months later, or a couple of years, I can't even remember exactly how long after, I was coming home, and I was speeding, and I missed my turn coming home. And since I didn't want to turn around and go back and all that, I knew that this railroad crossing existed. So I just simply put in my mind, I'm going to take this railroad crossing that I know exists. I just had to find it because I hadn't approached it from this other direction before. So as it turns out, I get on the railroad crossing. And right as I'm on the railroad crossing, I see lights in my rearview mirror. And I stopped immediately because I was only doing about between 5 and 10 miles an hour crossing this, these railroads. And this cop gets out, and I roll my window down, and he immediately starts yelling at me. He says, what the fuck are you doing out here on these goddamn railroad tracks? Can't you see the fucking sign? What kind of goddamn fucking idiot are you? What kind of fucking drugs are you on? And I then started explaining to him, after being shocked, that I missed my turn, exactly what I just explained to you here, how I missed my turn coming to work, and I missed my turn coming home from work. And after I explained that to him, he went right back into his tirade, literally repeating it almost word for word. What kind of fucking idiot are you? Can't you see the fucking sign, et cetera, et cetera. And when he finished his second part of it, I said, I've, I've crossed railroad tracks before. It's never been a, a problem. He says, and he looks at me and he goes, I know what I'm going to do with you. You're getting an eluding charge. And I knew the word eluding meant running, and I, and I said, what are you talking about? I wasn't running. And he said, you sit there, I'll be right back. And he, and he went to his car and made a call. And he came back to my car about 45 seconds, a minute later, and said, get out of the car. And I, and I said, what for? He said, I told you, you're under arrest for eluding. And I said, I, said, I wasn't eluding. And he says, that's the way it's getting ridden up. And he takes me out of the car and frisks me and puts me in handcuffs, and about 45 seconds later, some other cars come, two from the front and one from the back, almost simultaneously, right at the same time. I got two cop cars in front and one car in the back. So, so this has been a while after I've already been stopped. So the guy in the car in front of me, who, who parked in front of me, starts walking up, and he says to the officer who arrested me, his name is Douglas Pelton, the guy who arrested me, Mr. Uh, Sergeant Pelton, he, uh, this other guy, Sergeant Small, or whatever his name, uh, whether he's a sergeant or constable, or whatever, he says, he says, what's going on here? Like, you can tell he was confused. And I didn't know at the time what these guys knew that I didn't know. They knew this, there was something wrong. So, Pelton says to them, he says, he says, oh, he's some doctor, I'm taking him in for eluding, because I told him I was a doctor, I wasn't running. So, the cop says, what? And, he, and he, he ignored him and pointed over to another one of the other three cops who showed up, this lady, and said, don't just sit there, search his car. So she searches my car, but doesn't even do a thorough job, which we can get into later, but um, I'd rather not right now, but that's not a big deal. But anyways, he, he uh, shows me in the car, and long story short, I spend a night in jail, and I find out I've been charged with a felony criminal eluding charge, which carries, I guess, up to five years in jail, several thousand of dollars in fines, etc. My civil, my, my criminal defense alone cost me $17,500. And one of the first things we did 
was we got this cop in deposition. And he started telling lies right away. And I could see these lies when I got the deposition. One of the things he said was that one of the, the cops that came from the front, he said that they, they actually headed me off in the past. My lawyer asked the question in deposition, said, at some point, Dr. Bottom stopped. When did he stop? And Mr. Pelton said, another patrol car came from the other direction, and Dr. Cottom stopped then. In other words, he was painting a picture of a car chase that never happened, but he painted a picture of the ending of a car chase because somehow this car chase had to end, so he had to have some kind of description to the ending of the car chase that made sense. And, of course, he had this, this cop car there in a picture, and even said he even said, in deposition here, I have pictures. And he showed this picture of, of these two cop cars in front of me because he took pictures of the scene before we left. And you can see then that, that he was trying to describe this as something that happened when it didn't happen. Another thing he said in his deposition was something that would naturally have to occur in a car chase, and that was that he was on the radio calling it out. And as soon as I saw this, I said, that's a lie. He didn't make a call until after I was stopped and fully more than a minute after I was stopped. So, so I, I got the call log. I said, get the call log audio, get the call log, and get the call log supervisor in deposition. So we got the call log, we got the call log audio, and we got the call log supervisor in deposition. There was no call. There was no such call. The first call came in at about two minutes after his original clocking. His original clocking of me was at 422. The distance that we traveled was about a mile, which would put us at just over 423 at a, just around 55 miles an hour or so. And then another minute for berating me and then walking back to his car would put the call coming in at 424. And guess when the call comes in? 424. So we have testimony from his own call log, and his own call log supervisor, who, who was deposed, said that this was just a traffic stop and there was no call for an eluder. So he, he also claimed other things that would be required in a car chase. The other thing is a, is a siren, almost like a, a siren on a fire engine. The only reason that fire engines are going to go to a fire without, a, without their siren on is if the siren's broken. So he had to have his siren on. It was part of actually the second part of the eluding statute. The Florida statute require, doesn't require, but the second part of it requires a siren. And he charged me with the second part. There's three separate parts. There's one, two, and three. He charged me with subsection two, which says that he had his lights and siren on. He only had his lights on. He also didn't know that I had an eyewitness. You see, there's only one way out of Wildwood, out of the villages heading south, and that's down to 301. And being a dermatologist and running my own practice, when I get out of work, my staff is out of work. So one of my staff members happened to be on the road when I passed her, and right when I passed, uh, when I passed the police, she was still on the road, and then he finally turned his lights on when she passed him. And I was already over the peak of this long bridge that goes over these railroad tracks. There's a bridge there, and I was out of his sight. I was literally probably about 16 seconds past him, when he even turned on his lights, he was actually on the left side of this uh, four-lane divided road, not on the right side, and he had to cross lanes of traffic, so he was stuck. He was stuck behind traffic, and he couldn't come and get me right away, and that might be one of the reasons why he was pissed off. I don't know. So I had an eyewitness then also that he didn't have his siren on when he passed her, and he claimed in his deposition also and in his charging documents to have his siren on right from the get-go, which wouldn't make sense either because police don't use their siren in speeding tickets, at least not in the ones I've been pulled over for. I've been pulled over literally. I'm a speeder. I've been pulled over literally 20 times in the last 30 years uh, or, or, you know, 40 years. And, and they never have their siren on unless you're not pulling over. They turn their siren on then. They only use their lights. So we had an eyewitness, we had the lie about the siren, we had the lie about the calling it out, we had the lie about the other cop car coming in front of me. He also said that I made a reckless turn off the 301 to cross the railroad crossing in my 2009 Lexus LS460, a reckless right-hand turn on a straight right-angle turn in a city on wet pavement. And my tires got changed out literally about three months later. I was on ball tires. I've got a huge car, and I'm making a straight right-angle turn on wet pavement. It was physically impossible for me to take that turn in a reckless manner. So I ended up getting, um, through deposition, 
the state attorney, his name was Ed McDonough. Ed McDonough could see and sat there for these depositions. He sat there for the deposition of Mr. Pelton. He sat there for the deposition of Mr. Smaltz, who said, no, I got there when Dr. Cotton was already out of his car. He sat there for the deposition of the call log supervisor, who said, no, this was just a traffic stop. He himself, Ed McDonough, the state attorney, charged me with subsection 1 of the eluding statute, which does not require a siren. So that makes you wonder, what did the state attorney know besides that? As it turns out, I was not um, agreeing to their plea bargaining. They were trying to get me to plea bargain out to careless driving, and my lawyer said that this was the best deal they'd ever seen in an, elude, in an eluding case. And I said, I'm not plea bargaining out to careless driving. This is a lie. This guy's a liar, and the state attorney knows it because he was sitting there. One night before the, the, the pretrial hearing, because you have to go to a pretrial hearing before the actual trial, the state attorney called my lawyer, I guess, or maybe two nights before. I got the call the night before because I already had patients rescheduled and everything. I was ready to go to court. I couldn't wait. The, the state attorney abandoned the fel felony eluding charge and remanded it down to a lower court, a different court, and changed the charge to uh, reckless driving, which is sort of like a, a hybrid cr criminal misdemeanor. And so I got a call the night before from my lawyer, and he said, Dr. Cotton, I got good news and I got bad news. And I said, well, what's the good news? He said, well, the good news is your felony eluding charge is gone. I said, really? And he said, yeah. And I said, what's the bad news? And he says, well, they got you now. And I said, what do you mean they got me now? And he said, well, they remanded your case down to a lower court, and it's going to be administered by a judge named Skidmore. And this Judge Skidmore is a hanging judge, and him and Mr. McDonough, the state attorney, Ed McDonough, have been known to screw people over, not let them get their st stories out, and convict them on crimes that they're not guilty of. And if they convict you, he will often give people time on their first offense. And he said, and you know what that will do to your, criminal, to your, to your medical career, Dr. Cotton. And, of course, if anybody knows medicine, you know what that will do to my career. It will literally pretty well end it. I would not be able to take Medicare, Medicaid, um, the, the HMOs will follow suit. I would literally be destitute. I'd have to pick a different profession if I get criminal uh, jail time. Basically, it would screw me up like beyond belief. So I was livid, though, at the point now, knowing that my lawyer was the one that my direction asked all these questions of these other people we got deposed, Mr. Smalls and the call log supervisor. Mr. Smalls, again, was in the first car that was in front of me, another uh, you know, police officer, Wildwood Police. And he knew that this was a lie as well. And he was trying to get me to settle into this careless driving. He said, oh, they're putting careless driving on, on the, uh, uh, you know, uh, to, for you to, uh, as an offer. And I said, they already offered that. And he said, oh, this one's a better one. And I said, I'm not settling for careless driving. I said, put in a goddamn motion to dismiss. And he said, well, we can't put in a motion to dismiss. Really, Dr. Cotton, this is like a criminal thing. You don't just say you weren't robbing the bank. I mean, that is not going to work. And I, I yelled at him. I said, you put in a goddamn motion to dismiss. So... To make long story short, Hello? Yeah, are you there? No. Yep. Keep talking. So he, he uh, reluctantly put in a motion to dismiss. I had asked him to get me a draft before he sent it in. Never got me a draft. When the motion to dismiss was put in, it never mentioned one of the lies that I just talked about that we had a evidence on. And I was livid with my lawyer. I said, this is a useless motion to dismiss. It just says I didn't do it. And, and the, my lawyer said, well, we can't put in those other things because we can only put in, for the statute and for the rules, those things that are not in dispute. And I said, oh, my God, I can't believe it. Well, as it turns out, I wasn't, I wasn't worried anyways too much. I was angry, but I said, oh, the hell with it. No, I'll go to court on it. But I didn't know something that the state attorney's office knew, too. So the state attorney, rather than answering the motion to dismiss with legal precedent and with facts, filed something that guaranteed the state attorney getting out of the case without admitting to the malicious prosecution. The state attorney filed what's called a demurrer, and, and those in the legal profession know what a demurrer is, but those who don't don't know what it is. It's basically a statement that says, we agree with this motion that's come uh, in front of us here, but it doesn't apply in this case. And, of course, the judge now, seeing a well-written motion to dismiss by a defense lawyer, and a demurrer in a criminal case 
from the prosecution knew exactly what was being said, and what was being said was the prosecution just wanted out of the case, and they didn't want to drop the case themselves. So the, the, the judge had no choice but to dismiss the charge. And I went from a felony criminal charge to absolutely nothing without a judge or jury hearing the case and without anybody hearing any of the lies in the case and without me being able to utter any of the lies in the case and without the prosecution fully stopping the prosecution. That sounds like a riddle that has no answer to it, but that's how it happened. And it happened because everybody in the case knew that it was a lie, and I had the wherewithal and the balls to stand up for myself. If I had been somebody who was out on probation, out on parole, I would have been screwed over. I would have been back in jail. I would have had to have settled for their careless driving. I would have been, I would have been doing jail time, and I would have had no recourse whatsoever. And... My own lawyer lied to me. He said, listen, you can take these guys to civil court after you agree to this uh, careless driving stuff anyway. You can deal with the civil court stuff later. Later on, I found out, basically, if you, if you agreed to doing anything, you've admitted to, the, to, to doing something wrong, and you've admitted to these guys as actions. Therefore, you have no civil lawsuit at all pending afterwards. So I filed a case, uh, a charge against him with the Wildwood Police, the Wildwood police, when I went in there, the one guy who took the complaint said, oh, well, the people are upset by getting speeding tickets and stuff like that. But we've got car cameras on every car 24-7 and have for six years. I've been on the force for six years. And I said, well, this guy claimed he didn't have any car camera in his car. He said he didn't have a car camera in his car. And I knew I rode to jail in a car with a car camera. So, anyways, that report went to his captain, Valentino. This guy's name is Mr. Valentino. And Mr. Valentino never interviewed me, never interviewed Mr. Pelton, never interviewed my eyewitness, never interviewed any one of the three other cops who showed up, and never interviewed the call log supervisor who was also deposed, and wrote up a report exonerating Mr. Pelton of any wrongdoing, saying, oh, it's probable cause, you know, and then he sent this report to his chief of police. And the chief of police basically just signed off on it as well and sent a letter back saying, oh, probable cause is a fluid uh, concept, blah, blah, blah. And so I said, hell with this. I'm going to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. And I filed a complaint with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. And the Florida Department of Law Enforcement originally had a lady who was very receptive to me. She said she was going to meet me. She was going to interview me. She was going to take a look at my documents, everything we had, all the depositions, the call log, the call log, the uh, audio, everything. And, and she got busy, busy, busy every couple of weeks. There was busy, busy, busy. Then finally, I got a call from her one day. She said, oh, Dr. Cotter, I'm sorry, but this case is being handled over to one of our uh, agents in the Tampa office called um, Agent Thomas Stefan. So Agent Thomas Stefan, and I could tell in her voice that something wasn't quite right. I knew things weren't going to go well. The first conversation I had with, with Mr. Stefan, Agent Stefan of the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, was an angry Angry uh, Tony's like, hey, who are you? What do you say in a cop was lying? And I said, yeah, he was lying. He lied about a felony criminal charge against me. And he says, oh, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. I'm going to find out what's going on, you know. And he, he went and had a private meeting with Mr. Valentino. Again, Mr. Valentino is Mr. Pelton's boss, Mr. Pelton, the guy who busted me and lied. He had a private meeting with, with one of the state attorney's office, Mr. Marshall, who's a, uh, an investigator in the state attorney's office. He had a private conversation with each one of those. He never interviewed me, never interviewed Mr. Pelton, never interviewed my eyewitness, never interviewed one of the three cops who showed up, and never interviewed the call out supervisor who was deposed either. He wrote up a report essentially the same as what Mr. Valentino had written up basically just exonerating Mr. Pelton completely. So I ended up filing a complaint with the state attorney's office. Of course, the state attorney was already sitting there, you know, at the time when all this deposition was going on. But I complained over his head. I, I, I complained to a Mr. Brad Keith in the Ocala Division. And I got a letter back saying, oh, this is already being investigated and we'll be doing no further stuff. It was already been investigated by the office that where you were prosecuted out of. And I said, oh, really? I said, okay. So I called up that office. I said, I hear you guys did an investigation here. I want to see the paperwork on that. And I get a letter back saying, there is no paper. There will be no paper. There will be no, no further investigation. We reviewed the files on, on um, you know, we reviewed the documents on file, and that's it. 
So I went through every level of law enforcement in Florida and got absolutely nowhere on a slam dunk perjury. So eventually I just I passed it up and I was like, these guys are a bunch of criminals. I'm getting nowhere. So I, I got busy and whatnot, and it was just eating away at me over years. Finally, I filed a federal lawsuit, and the federal lawsuit is 5-16-CV-413. For anybody out there that thinks this is a fake case, they can look it up. 5-16-CV-413, filed in 2016 in the uh, Middle District of Florida in Tampa. So, to make a long story short, the Judge Moody, this Judge Moody in this case, writes a, a report on, or writes his order on this case, in his, in his order, he states that my evidence was scant, even though I had eyewitness affidavit, even though I had his call log, his call log audio, I had his pictures, I had his, his everything. I had everything to show that this guy was lying. I had this statement from Mr. Smalls, the deposition of Mr. Smalls, who said I didn't get there until Dr. McCartney was already out of his car. Mr. Moody, the Judge Moody, says I, my evidence was scant, and that I bragged, he called it bragging when I said I went from a felony criminal charge to absolutely nothing without a judge or jury hearing the case, etc. He said, Dr. Cotton brags about this and he equates it to exoneration. And then he said also, he, he, quoted, he quoted erroneous, false legal precedent, which blew me away. He quoted a case in the 11th Circuit that said that, that if somebody is arrested for, for, for something, and they could have been arrested for something, their arrest that they were arrested for was false, that you cannot bring a false arrest a charge against this person. And to me, that didn't make any sense at all, because it's almost like if you could be arrested for jaywalking, and he doesn't arrest you for jaywalking, but fabricates a cocaine dealing charge against you and gets caught fabricating that felony cocaine dealing charge, then it's okay because he could have arrested you for jaywalking, but didn't. And I said, this doesn't make any sense. So I went to the 11th Circuit case that where this was quoted from. And the 11th Circuit case where it was quoted from actually was a quote itself from another case. So I said, well, I'm not at the source here yet. I need to go to this other case. And I went to the other case that it was quoted from, and sure enough, there's no such legal precedent at all. In other words, the 11th Circuit, which is out of Atlanta, which is over the, the, uh, southern, the middle district of Florida, that, that circuit had originally put this ruling in and had, had somehow put in these words that were not in the case that they quoted it from at all. It was false, erroneous legal precedent, which makes sense. You can't just bust somebody for a felony make it, and get caught lying about it, and then just because you could have arrested them for speeding, that, that, you can, that their false arrest is, is uh, valid. And I hope this doesn't make any sense at all. And I put in my appeal to the 11th Circuit, and of course the 11th Circuit essentially just just went right along with the lower circuit, uh, lower uh, middle district of Tampa's ruling, and said, "Oh well, you know, you don't have a case." And that's where we're at right now. Now I'm stuck with possibly taking this to the Supreme Court, and we know that the Supreme Court, one, uh, you know, doesn't hear cases very often. They hear one in 20 actual paid cases. I'm pro se, which means I have to pay for this myself, but I'm not going, you know, to the court without money. I'm paying for these myself. So if you guys have any questions, you know, go ahead and ask me. Well, we're going to have to go to break now. Uh, Laura, you want to take us out? Yeah, at that time, stay on the line with us. We're going to go take a short commercial break, and we'll be back in just a moment. Okay. There is a very high likelihood your mortgage contains an extensive error. At Mortgage Fraud Examiners, we know just how costly a missed opportunity can be. For almost 40 years, we have consulted, retained, and referred to by attorneys, lawyers, trial practitioners throughout the nation. Put another way, we are the trusted source for litigation support. A foreclosure is basically an allegation the homeowner breached the contract by failing to make timely payments. The contract is clear. The borrower promised they would make timely payments, and if they didn't, the lender could take the property. The only way to overcome the homeowner's breach is to show the lender breached first. Identify errors that would void the contract. Identify regulatory violations. Identify appraisal fraud and other fraudulent contact. And the only way to find these wrongs is to thoroughly examine the whole mortgage transaction. This meticulous examination...
evaluation of your mortgage transaction and appraisal can identify legal defects that would make your mortgage unenforceable and entitle you to compensation or even free title to your property. Call us at 844-920-7200. Mortgage Fraud Examiners, that's 844-920-7200. 844-920-7200. We're back on AMFM 24-7 radio. Call is area code 646-668-8512. And we just heard from our special guest, a uh, doctor in Florida, about his uh, unfortunate um, dealings with the, uh, the police down there. Uh, Dr. John, would you like the bad news first or the worst news first? Say that again. I said, would oh, you like yeah, the no, bad news? news? Thank you. The bad news first or the worst news first? Oh, <laughs> either one. Well, your problem is, like a lot of people have, do you know how many times I've heard this story? Um, I'm, I have a litigation support company that we've trained criminal defense attorneys for almost 40 years on how to win cases, and uh, I've been involved in over 750 criminal jury defense trials, and I can tell you flat out, there's a term for what the officers do and did in your case. It's called testifying. Testifying, yes. Yes, that's what they call it. Um, Almost every case, that a traffic case, or frankly any other criminal defense case that I've been involved in, uh, there's not one. Well, there was one once where the cop didn't lie, and I called up his captain, and I said he should get accommodation because uh, I could tell you flat out that most cops lie. This guy told the truth, and he should get accommodation for that. Uh, but, um, yeah. yeah. What, what happened to you is quite common. It happens all the time. So that's the bad news. The worst news is, is that you really have no case and you're wasting your time. Right. Yeah, and that's the problem. And then the problem is that he's in here and checked it all the way through the federal courts. Yeah, here is the biggest problem you had in the first place was, is your, quote, so-called criminal defense attorney. Um, we call them dump trucks what that guy did to you. A dump truck is someone who takes your case and then basically gets you to plead out. 98% of all cases are pled out. Um, I tell people all the time, look, you want to plead guilty? You can plead guilty for free. You, you don't need an attorney to plead guilty. You can plead guilty for free. If you want to win your case and you think you have a case, you need to go to trial. But the problem of it is it's hard to overcome a liar, and it's hard to overcome liars. So if you had a bunch of cops who were willing to lie, and you didn't have any evidence to show them lying, you're going to lose your case. And regrettably, your, your lawyer didn't do a very good job, because first things first, he could have subpoenaed those um, videos, he could have subpoenaed the audios, he could have subpoenaed all of that. Well, we did. We got the audio, we got the call, and we did subpoena the call, call the, uh, um, the video also. They ended up sending me video from one of the person's cars that doesn't even have my car on the video. It ends like about halfway through where the guy doesn't even arrive on the scene. These people are corrupt, let me tell you. Well, more importantly, more importantly, here's the thing, too. Um, cases like eluding, um, it's a strict liability case. They have to prove willfulness. They had to prove that you were willfully avoiding that police officer or eluding that police officer. Now, technically, technically, if a police officer pulls behind you and lights you up, Technically, you're supposed to pull over. If you don't pull over immediately, technically, you're eluding him. That's how the law is written. So technically, you're eluding. Now, if, like for example, it's late at night. It's a woman. She sees lights flashing behind her, and she knows a mile up the road 
there's a, a shopping center that she can pull into and there's lights on and that kind of stuff. Okay, she was technically eluding, but she wasn't willfully eluding him because she wanted to go to an area where, where she felt that she'd be safe. So there's a lot of defenses that he could made on your part but, and didn't. Uh, so, but it, it, I think if, if I heard you correctly, that the guy cut his lights on and then you kept on driving for a couple of minutes. No, no, I was, only, I was only on the road for about a less than a minute, and he never caught up to me because he had all the, the traffic to come through and to catch up to me. I've done the mathematics, and I even put together a little yeah. sort of claymation-type video. He doesn't catch up to me until I'm actually on the railroad tracks, well, well, which is where I saw his life and which is where I stopped, you see. And then yeah, he no, lied no. about everything to try to fabricate an okay. actual car chase. Okay, well, hold on for a second. So... So are you telling me that there was traffic separating you and him? Yes, absolutely. And that was, okay. that was well, uh, see, right off the bat. See, right off the bat, if, if, if I was your lawyer, that would have been a defense. Because how the hell is my client supposed to know that he was being with us if there were clients in between, if there were other motors in between the police officer and my client? So, so the, the issue is it was abandoned by the state attorney. We never got to any real defense. All we were doing was subpoenaing their, their people about this case. And when it turned out that this was a lie, the state attorney abandoned the case. And then I said, put in a motion to dismiss. So essentially, other than my lawyer going along with everything, he basically did what I told him to do. And this case never went anywhere. I got nothing. I got zero. Yeah, but, but so that means you won. Yeah. So, but, but to go after it further, you're just basically wasting your time. Now, what the 11th Circuit was saying was, I, I know what the 11th Circuit was saying, because what they were saying is wrong. Now, if you can stop for running a stoplight, and, well, that's not even a mental, but let's say you, you, there was a deep spot, and you were stopped for a DUI. Based on that arrest, they can't charge you with murder. Now, if they stopped you for a DUI, I'm hearing, I'm hearing a bunch of noise in the background from your phone, it sounds like. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Well, I hear what you're, yeah, I hear what you're saying. It's just that it, you know, none of that applied in my case because this guy was so far behind me. And it was just a basic lie. Why did he lie about the siren? Why did he lie about the car? Why did he lie about the car coming in front of me? He had to because he had to paint a picture of something that sounded legitimate. Yeah, yeah. It's not fraud. It, it, I mean, it's, that's just what cops do is they lie. So, right. now, if, well, yeah, it is fraud. But, I mean, look, if, if our show, I, I could get a thousand people to call in that is basically the same thing that happens to them. Sure. It's just that. This is what they do. That's why they term it test the lie. You right. guys, and I just wanted everybody to hear this story because the, the things can happen to them, and if that does, they should get a hold of me. Yeah. I, I want to I jump in here and ask, and ask Storm now. Yeah, this, this story scares me because, you know, I'm a woman. I'm alone in the car. If the same thing happened to me, I, 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 you know, I wouldn't necessarily have the money to defend myself. Uh, or, well, but, that's why, but, well, that's why... Uh, I mean, common sense didn't prevail in this case. This was a very simple case. He had a dump truck for a lawyer. The lawyer could have gone to the prosecutor and said, hey, look, this is a bunch of BS. You know, my guy, there was, you know, there was motorists separating my guy and the police officer. After the police officer weaved through the traffic and finally got to my guy, he says, you're eluding me. How was my guy ever going to know he was eluding anybody? Well, the point yeah, was that the Stanley yeah, Gunnell yeah. had that. That discussion occurred, and they were, they were getting it down to careless driving. And I was given that choice, and I said, no, I'm not bargaining with these guys. They're liars. Yeah, no, no. You just say, we'll go to court on the careless driving. Exactly. But and he yeah, did it to the state of, because I, I put in a motion to dismiss, and, uh, and the state attorney responded with a demurrer, and the, the, the judge threw the case out. So they was, ended up with zero. It was a complete fabrication. 
Yeah, so but I mean you won. Yeah, but I want to. I want to ask. I want to storm. I want to ask a question for for people listening, who because this is a nightmare case. I mean, it cost yeah. it cost the doctor a lot of money on something that actually didn't happen because this the lawyer decided. Case. It's not. This this is not a, a nightmare case. This is an everyday occurrence. Almost yeah, but it's every, a nightmare. Well, this could be a nightmare if I had had a uh, if I had had if I was out on parole or probation or had no money. This, this is just agreeing to this criminal cartel that's basically running these systems. This is a scam on the American people. And they're right. protected so my, all the way through the federal courts, which is the point. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but I want to ask a quick question. Is it a good idea? Because nowadays you see those cameras that they have in cars. I think they might put on your them. phone. I put them on my car. Oh, I put them. After the fact, though. After the fact. Yeah. So then if you have, if you have that... The other question I would have is, let's say, you know, they ask you to get out of your car. Is there anything illegal about video, videoing what the police officer is saying to you at that time, or will they just grab the phone out of your hand and break it? Well, uh, here, you, you, never know what, you never know what a police officer is going to do. So, and, and if you point something at somebody and he doesn't real, uh, see what it is, he may pull, draw down on you. But my point is, a couple of things happened. One, they never should have searched your car. You had to allow them to search your car because they can't search your car without your permission. If they do, that case goes out the door immediately. So I'm just saying that based on what you told me, your, your legal represent, representation was poor at best. Uh, this was a very, very simple case. Um, you know, the, the prosecutor, look, the prosecutor doesn't know you. Um, he doesn't the care. Prosecutor what extorted me. The prosecutor continued to prosecute me after he had testimony in front of him from another police officer that the police officer who arrested me was lying. The state attorney sat there and had testimony from the call log supervisor after Mr. Pelton testified, and the state attorney knew that he was lying two times. He had all the information he needed to properly prosecute Mr. Pelton and stop the case against me, and he did neither. This prosecutor is that these people are all engaged in a corrupt in engagement Let of criminal Let me stop you. Prosecutors do not prosecute police officers even when they know they're lying. That's the problem. And that, that is a problem. But the, it's the old typical he said... He said, the police officer said one thing, you said something else. Does his own police mean? officers corroborated my story on two different levels, and I had well, eyewitnesses that corroborated, corroborated my story, too. So I that's had corroboration from his own police department. That's why There's a difference not. between he said, she said. This was not a he said, she said case, which is exactly what Thomas Stefan of the Florida Department of Law Enforcement told me. He said, we're not going to prosecute a he said, she said. I said, this wasn't he said, she said at all. I said, this is what I said, what his own cop said, what his own cop supervisor, what his own cop call log supervisor said, which he was lying, and I witnessed that he was lying. It wasn't just he said, she said. It's not. Not even close. Yeah, well, he had, had all the evidence. evidence. Yeah. The problem is he had a prejudiced witness. Uh, that really they don't listen to. Um, but at the end of the day, this is a very common occurrence. happens all the time. Um, it's, it will continue to happen. It's just that I tell people when they go out on the street, you know, you got to be careful because policemen are not like policemen were 50 years ago. They're not there to protect and serve. They're like big game hunters. They want to put your head up on their wall. And so that's just how it is these days. So, but at the end of the day, you're really wasting your time taking this thing to the of the United States. They won't even grant certain or something like that. Um, you know, what, by the way, when you sue them, what statute did you sue them on? Well, the title? You know, um, I can't remember the exact statute, but it was you know, civil rights statute, 1873, I believe. Yeah. Title 42, uh, you know, Fourth yeah. Amendment, uh, false arrest. Yeah. Title 42, probably Title 42, 1983 is what you're under. Um, but, you know, it's just, I mean, this, this goes on every single, as we're speaking right now, 
the same thing going on. But at the end of the day, uh, again, uh, you got bad representation. Well, I got up. Well, oh, I mean, that isn't the point. To me, my representation yeah, that is that isn't the point. Dr. John, you got off through your efforts, not through his efforts. Yeah. Right. But either way, you know, the point is, is that, that the federal line, the state attorney is in bed with them, and the federal courts are in bed with the, with the line police, too. This is what I wanted to get across to the people. Right. And, 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 and this, um, you know, Not a storm. Let me let, let me interrupt for a second. I, I have a friend whose daughter was murdered by somebody, and it kind of went through. You know, everybody she could, or you know, a, a good attorney, a black king, you know, all the politicians here, and they all threw her off, and the guy got away with murder. What is that noise? Yeah. Yeah. The guy the guy got away with murder, and it was all the same people, or a lot of the same people, Dr. Khan, that you mentioned. So, you know, Storm, I tell you, in Florida, it, it's not like anywhere else. It's sort of like the Bermuda Triangle. Maybe things happen, you know, in other parts of the country, but in here, in this area, it's worse. They all, they all get together and, and make up their own story, and there's right. no way for, for a normal person to win or compete, especially like, right. you know, Dr. Cotton, he, he had enough money to do this, but a regular person, they'd be in jail just because they couldn't afford to defend themselves. Yeah. Or because they get they get they get some crappy you know uh, criminal defense attorney you know and and you know assigned by the court and you know they don't really they just want to get it through that's it they don't they don't care so I tell you these these stories in Florida uh, they're true and and Dr. Yeah, Trump's story scared me it's not indigenous to just Florida it happens all over it happens all the time it happens every day like I've said right now during this uh, during our show today trust me it's happened hundreds of times. Yeah, but so so people don't understand that, that. and know that they have people they can contact. Yeah, that's the yeah. sad part of it. So, you, you know, I mean, think about it. You're driving down the street. Cop pulls you over and says you're speeding. Okay, maybe you were, maybe you weren't, but he's going to say you were, and it's going to be his word against your word, and that's what happens most of the time that these guys, matter of fact, at night, you have these groups like Mad and Sad. They have statistics that show that, that after 10 o'clock at night, 85% of the people out there have been drinking. So what happens? Here it is, 10, 15 at night. You're driving home. Uh, they have statistics that tell them that 85% of the people have been drinking, okay? Here you are driving down the street. The cop finds a reason to pull you over. Maybe you were drinking. Maybe you weren't. If you, if you had alcohol on your breath, that doesn't mean you've been drinking. Maybe you had Listerine, but he's going to arrest you. He's going to make you step out of the car and take these silly roadside tests that nobody can pass anyway. I mean, this stuff just goes on day after day it, after day. It, it really, you know, Listening to you two guys, it makes me want to carry a dummy, put a dummy in the other seat of my car so it looks like there's two people. And it would, it would, it would, it would, it would people, mitigate people the need to get me. these cameras. They need to get these cameras. I've got them. Yeah, I've got them now. Well, you know, the, yeah, thing, to do, the thing to do is, 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 you know, you can have your own camera. You can, you, you can, you can, they look like a yeah, radar detector. Yeah, you can tape the conversation. Just, Put your cell phone up on the dashboard, put your hands on the steering wheel, and just tape it. Good but, idea. Uh, like I said, I've heard his story a thousand times. I mean, this is nothing new to me. Trust well, me. I'm surprised because I've, I've been talking to people for 20 years, and I see 50 patients a day, and I've told a lot of people about these stories, and I haven't heard one. Uh, well, I've heard other stories, worse ones, like even in murder cases for patients who had their sons or daughters son blown away by the cops, you know, in the standard where the, the, the guy's dead with 17 bullets in him, but, but no, um, I haven't heard too many well, you know, like heard, this. I, I, I've heard him because I've trained um, uh, law firms on criminal defense and stuff like that, and they bring their clients in, their clients tell us the stories, and I mean, you know, I, I've just heard it, you know, thousands of times. Yeah, so you know. That's why. Well, guys, we're... 
That's why they have that term called testify. So that's yeah. very reason. Yes. Well, Dr. Yeah. Tom, I want to thank you for, for getting your story out and sharing it with us so it will make people sure. make more aware and get the cameras. Can help get, get those cameras. Yeah, get those cameras. And, and Storm, thanks for listening to the story. And for our listeners, thanks for joining us today on Forrester's Radio. You can join us again next Monday from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Time Live. Remember, we do want to hear your stories, and you can contact us through the Forrester's Radio Facebook page. Thanks very much, guys. Appreciate it. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.